Good morning and welcome to our final last lecture of this academic year. I'm so pleased to see all of you here. I know this is a very busy moment in the semester for all of us students and faculty in particular. So thank you so much for being present this morning. It's, this is not my slide. I'm a hockey coach. I'm a hockey coach. <laughs> More on that later from our speaker, that's not me. Okay, um, it's very much my pleasure this morning to introduce our varsity men's hockey coach, Tim Coglin, as this morning's last lecturer. I just confirmed a few minutes ago that indeed Tim is about one month shy of his 20th anniversary here at St. Norbert College. Mm -hmm. And in that time, he has moved our hockey program from its infancy to a place of consistently high performance that no doubt evokes some measure of fear and rightly so in our opponents. Now, if you go on to our athletics website and pull up his bio, you can just scroll and scroll and scroll for a long time and keep scrolling as it describes his tremendous record of success in consistently shaping teams that have performed at a high level and won more than their fair share, but that's okay with us, um, of victories and titles. Uh, in addition, Tim is a former hockey player himself and someone who has completed the Wisconsin Ironman Triathlon. But perhaps more importantly, he's a devoted husband and father. I told him if his daughter indeed does come back into the room, no one's listening to him because she's way cuter. No offense. <laughs> She's cuter than me too, it's okay. Um, but we trust that he has very much to share with us all this morning about living a life filled with passion and commitment. Will you please join me in welcoming Coach Coglin? Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I, I hadn't thought of this before Don Augustine, our track coach, just came down and Dr. Frick is here, so the timing is good. Uh, so when you give your last lecture, does that mean this is it for me? Am I out after this? <laughs> oh, Don brought it to my attention. I hadn't really thought of that, so I thought I'd get that clarified first. So uh, again, thank you for the invitation to be here. It is my pleasure uh, to be here in front of all of you. And uh, I'm not exactly sure how we're going to connect the dots, but uh, at some point by the end of uh, today's session, hopefully we can go back and, and put things together that seem to make sense. Uh, to all of us. You know, one of the unique things I think we have here at St. Norbert um, is the opportunity to sit you know, in a collective group like this with people and talk about our faith and feel good about it and not feel like we're going to be chastised or ridiculed or, you know, all the politically correct stuff that happens in the world these days. So to be able to express some of our opinions of faith and be together, I think, is one of the things that really makes uh, this place very, very special. When I give speeches, per se, or when I'm normally, when I'm addressing uh, people, so I got a couple things I want to start off with. Normally, when I'm addressing our guys, as the group that I t typically talk to, it's usually in our locker room space, um, and it's usually a pre-game speech or a pre-practice type of speech. And guys are just kind of hanging out, sitting in their stalls, and they're usually just sitting in their underwear. So it'd make me more comfortable if you guys would gear down right now. <laughs> I would definitely be more comfortable. Number one. Um, number two, uh, I, I you know I typically. Uh, I will change the language for this room because we, we use really big words and I don't want to leave anybody behind today. So we'll, we'll, we'll scale it back a little bit in terms of the language. Um, and I always start, usually I run it by my wife first. I always start with a little story and uh, I didn't run it by her because she always says, Tim, that's not appropriate. So I just said, I'm going to take a pass on this one and start with it anyway. So uh, it's a story about these two little five-year-old boys. And the two little five-year-old boys are having a discussion. The one little fellow, the first little fellow, is pretty distraught. He's, you could tell he's visibly distraught. And his friend's like, well, what's wrong? So he tells his friend, well, I'm going to have surgery tomorrow, and I'm, I'm really worried about the surgery. And his friend says, oh, surgery? Well, what, what are you having done? He says, I'm being circumcised. And the, first, the second little five-year-old says, oh, now I get it. That happened to me when I was born. I couldn't walk for a year. I'm, uh, you know, I, I think the, the title on the slide page is I'm a hockey coach statement. I'm a hockey coach question mark. And really are these life's biggest questions. And again, I, I hope to be able to get back to answer that at, at some point as we get a little further down uh, the way. Really, uh, the question that I'm 
uh, wanting to answer or wanting to talk about is a question that we get from a lot of our students, and I'm sure you do too, and from a lot of people in life, and that's how do I get there from here? And how do you get from point A to point B? Uh, whether, whether it's your job, your family, your school, whether you're a teenager, whether you're a college student or in retirement, you know, how do you get from point A to point B? We're very much of a, uh, write me a prescription so I know how to get there, give me a script. And as all of us know in this room, there is no script. You simply make the best, most informed decision that you can with the information you have at hand and go forward. And it's a little bit of blind luck in that sense. And uh, so clearly, you know, the journey is, is uh, not a script. In the, in, the, in the sport world and in life, we tend to teach things in black and white. It's if this happens, then you do this. But in reality, there is no A to B connection there because it's so fluid. Uh, a game, a fluid game going back and forth, or our life, just how there's so many different variables, you're sort of always in the gray area. You're seldom in the black and white. If it was all black and white, it would be easy, and everybody would know where to go. Uh, so to be in that sort of gray area um, all the time and then make the best informed decision you can with the information you have, I think, is an important skill, and it's something we need to continue. It, it comes firsthand to me from when my niece was here. My niece graduated from St. Norbert, played in our softball team, was a, was a catcher on the softball team. In 2004, she graduated, and I just remember her at 18, didn't have a clue, at 19, not sure. At, she went to the teacher education program because her dad was a teacher, and she came to St. Norbert because I was here and there was a comfort level there, but really just like always, how do I get there? Like, how can I get to this position, that job, uh, this school, whatever it might be? And so kind of following Kaylee's career and talking to her in the sense of being uh, a, a mentor or a person in her life that she would confide in, just kind of watching her journey. Eventually she did graduate from here in 2004 in education and she went to the regular ed setting, which wasn't her cup of tea. Her dad was a regular ed for 30 years, but just not her cup of tea. She did one year, and then she kind of split off, and she started teaching really high-risk kids. She'd go into buildings like where there's only six kids. These are kids that can't be in the regular ed, and there's drug abuse and all kinds of things going on. And she really liked the high-risk kid, but still wasn't confident that's where she wanted to be. Frankly, it was uncomfortable for her family, too, because she's in some pretty precarious spots. Um, so. Ultimately, she went back to Gonzaga University and did a master's degree in counseling, and now she is a regular ed counselor at a high school in the lower mainland in British Columbia and just absolutely loves her life. But this is how many years after she's been asking the questions, how do I get there from here? So that's one example, I think, of uh, uh, what we see from our students, and uh, that's a personal example from, from our own uh, family. So what I want to do today is kind of walk through my journey uh, as to how did I get here from there? And how did our lives come to where we are at this resting point or at this point in our lives? And uh, just have a look at um, how we got here. So in order to uh, look back, I think we, we need to look forward. In order to look forward, we need to look back. And so I'm gonna, uh, Dave Ramsey is, a, uh, mm -hmm. is an author that I like, a radio host. He's a Christian financial counselor, a coach for 20 years, 25 years, author of many, many uh, good books. Some of you may be aware of him. Financial Peace University, Seven uh, Baby Steps to Debt Reduction. And Dave always answers questions in the shoes of the person that he's talking to. So what would I do if I were in your shoes? And so again, thinking about how did I get here uh, from there? Um, that's kind of the perspective that I am going to go forward with, okay? So I'll give you a little bit of my history. I was born and raised in Western British, Colum in, uh, British Columbia, the westernmost province in Canada. Uh, born uh, youngest of five in our family. Brother John is the eldest, three girls in between. And uh, we were in a very small town. How small, you ask? 65 people small. <laughs> so that's a small town. Um, that, there was a, a gas station. The gas station also was the grocery store, and it was the post office, and the lady that ran the show was a nurse. And so th that's how small of a town it was. Uh, there were 65 people, and that included the seven uh, within my family. Um, and we had a one-room school, a school room at that time, so I'm not sure if my middle sister, Shirley, who you'll hear a little bit more about, was in that class because she's five years older. My sister, Barb, that's two years older, was definitely in that class, and the teacher went desk to desk like you know, many of us have read about in the, 
really old days. Uh, but my, my sister Shirley, I'll talk a little bit more about, she was really my protector. She used to beat the tar out of kids for me. Like really, she protected me. And it sounds kind of funny to stand here today and think that I needed my sister to protect me, but she still protects me today in many ways. Um, we didn't have video games and we didn't have electronics that kids have today. We just played in the dirt, right? I mean, we're just out playing in the dirt all the time. And uh, one time I was out playing in the dirt and we were making dirt bombs and launching them at each other. <laughs> and I got clipped right here in the head and got opened up. So the first thing my sister Shirley did was go catch the kid that hit me with a dirt bomb. And then my mom rushed me to the grocery store so I could see the nurse. <laughs> there's, no, uh, there's no hospital uh, you know, within a couple of hours. So when we left Westbridge, my father was a millwright and he worked for a company in a sawmill business. And when we left Westbridge, we moved to a, a mega city, uh, like a major city, 5,000 people. Uh, town of uh, Summerland, British Columbia, which is where I really grew up and spent the majority of my uh, growing years. Now I'm in second grade, I've just got through the first grade, and already it's different, like the classroom that where the teacher went desk to desk versus in a classroom with a whole bunch of other kids, and the uh, teacher doesn't spend much, we just oil and water. This teacher, Mrs. Stevenson, just didn't go well in the second grade, didn't go well for me. It seemed like I was in trouble all the time. I'm sitting in class one day, and there's a knock at the door. So we all kind of look over and the door swings open. It's my sister Shirley, the seventh grader, who's in the other end of the building. She wants a word with Mrs. Stevenson. <laughs> so she, uh, she comes and has a word with Mrs. Stevenson and she says, listen, Tim never had any problem. He had a really good teacher in the first grade, Mrs. Lotart. So that's the first time my sister Shirley and I uh, frequented the principal's office together. <laughs> Truly, uh, by, by being in Summerland, uh, that gave just a lot more opportunity for all of us, all five kids within our family. And uh, for me, that really opened the door for sports, uh, hockey, baseball, soccer. Uh, at an early age, at probably 10, I was a motocross guy. I loved motorcycles, lived in the mountains, rode every day. So motocross, I was sure, was going to be something in my life. By the time I was 12, I was racing uh, regularly. Mom was packing us up and taking off on the weekends. Uh, I think it was at 13, uh, raced for a provincial championship in BC. By the time I was 14, finished top five in all of Canada uh, for our class at the Canadian Nationals. So I was, I was really sure that um, motocross was my path. And I think we're all at different stages of our lives, we're really sure of something. And then as we get beyond that, we're really sure that probably wasn't it. Um, and so what, what, what happened next is I continued up the ladder. I, I had always been a pretty good hockey player and hockey became my number one passion. And it turns in retrospect, to be here 20, well, 22 years now coaching in the college game, turns that hockey was probably a better choice than motocross at 16. So uh, that's good news. I did move away from home to play junior hockey, which is the path of most of our young men. Uh, so I've not actually lived at my house since I was 17. Uh, once I packed up and moved out, I was, I was gone from that point in time. And, and then after I was done with juniors, I obviously you know, moved to the college game. And um, that's where uh, Coach Mazzolini, Karen Mazzolini, I don't know if Karen's here this morning, but Karen Mazzolini uh, in our business office, Coach Mazzolini uh, had recruited me to come to UW Stevens Point. And that's where we start to connect the dots a little bit about, uh, you know, like that cheer over there? We've got another pointer in the house. Um, that's where we start to kind of connect the dots. Uh, Coach Mazzolini had given me an opportunity to come down and, and go to school and play hockey. And I was, because I was on my own, uh, n no children in my family had ever gone to school, higher ed. So we really didn't have the infrastructure built in to, to set that up. So I was really on my own. Um, and I've worked all my life. When I was 10, I worked in dad's sawmill. When I was you know, playing junior, 17, 18, 19, I was working in a sporting goods store. I had a full-time job always. Uh, and uh, even in college, like when kids would go off to spring break, I could stay and put in a 40 hour week, I'd stay and work. I never took a spring break because that was always important to pay the bills. So Coach Mazzolini, I said, you know, one of the, one of the things that would stop me from coming is not having a job. So he, he went to a local man on the campus at Stevens Point, there's a bike shop called Campus Cycle, and it sits right on the campus there. And um, he talked to the owner, a guy by the name of Carl Canese, and so I had a job lined up to go down and work. It just made my uh, decision to go to school much easier at that time. So I jumped on it. I go down to school and I'm, I'm working at the bike shop for uh, Carl and Karen Canese. They have a son whose name is Kevin and he played on the football team, running back for the football team. Um, so things are just kind of clicking along and we're about three months into my freshman year. It's December time and uh, the front of the store is all glass on this side and it's all glass on the, on the side facing over towards the Quant Fieldhouse. So, we're watching one day, the guys, the mechanics in the back of the shop, we stick our heads out, the girls track team is coming jogging down the sidewalk. So guys are all kind of sticking their heads out to 
see which girls are on the track team and who's doing what. And they, they walk right to the front of the, the shop and then they're all just jogging in place, kind of staying warm. Snowflakes are coming down. They've all got their hats on, their toques on. And this one girl comes right in the front of the store and she zips right through past us all. And she goes into the back room and she sees Carl and she says something to him, leans up, gives him a big kiss on the cheek, turns around and runs out. So I immediately looked and she's really, really a good looking gal. And I lean over to Carl and I said, who is that? And he says, that's my daughter, Barbara, which I had no idea Barb even existed. And Barb obviously uh, uh, today is, is my wife and mother of the children. Uh, um, fast forward, uh, just, just kind of an offbeat story, but fast forward three years. So I, I spent the whole next semester trying to get a date with Barb and eventually did. And, and her, her remembrance of the whole deal is, yeah, you know, I always thought you were a nice guy, but you talk too much. And I thought, well, Okay, I can live with that. Fa fast forward uh, three years now, we've been dating for a long time. Ultimately, we dated for five years, but three years in, we're working in the bike shop, Kevin and I, and actually it's just uh, the three of us, Barb, Barb's dad, and th the windows again, the windows in the building are all glass, and there's a little running store around the corner, and there's a window guy that comes in to clean things up, to, you know, outside of the window, inside of the windows. If you're not busy, we just help him. We slide all the bikes away from the front window, and he comes in and does his deal. So when he walks through the door, we're, we're helping him slide bikes, and he's just a guy, and he's just starting guy conversation. He's like, you guys see the girl next door? See the girl at work next door? We kind of look, because we sort of know where this is going, so we just let the conversation die. He picks it up again, he starts down the path, and he's like, she's really good looking. You see the girl next door? And so I stopped the conversation. I said, listen, just so you know, and I point at her brother, Kevin. I say, that's her brother, Kevin. And then Kevin points at me and says, that's her boyfriend. And then I look at her dad and go, that's her dad. So <laughs> that did stop the conversation finally. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I did not know why I went to Stevens Point at the time, but I'm very aware of why I went to Stevens Point at this time. So I think there are those moments in your life where you reflect back, and uh, that is certainly one of those times where we reflect back. Fast forward now to, to uh, in, in our own lives. We, Barb and I both graduate. I signed with the Vancouver Canucks. I'm going to training camp in 89. Uh, Barb is a psychology sociology major on campus, which for anybody here that's a psychology, means you go to grad school, because that's what's next if you're psychology sociology. And she chooses uh, to go uh, to be an educational psychologist at UW-Milwaukee, and, and that's her path. So she goes uh, off to school when I go off to training camp. Um, the next year I spent overseas, I played in Scotland for a year in the uh, British Premier League. Barb's still in grad school. Ultimately, during that two-year window, Coach Mazzolini leaves Stevens Point to the University of Minnesota. The assistant coach gets the head job, and now there's a vacancy for an assistant job. I'm a couple years out of pro and I'm, I'm kind of like, well, I was going to go back and play, but I would just soon get something a little bit more stable. So I jumped back on board and I become the assistant hockey coach at, at Stevens Point. And uh, that was at a time when uh, we played St. Norbert just to see if they were serious. Coach Van Alstein had uh, his team come over to play. Uh, George Robles team actually come over to play us at Stevens Point. And at St. Uh, uh, we beat St. Norbert 21 to 1. And that was a gift, because it was 11 nothing after one. Uh, so I was on the bench on the opposite side for that one. Fast forward again to 1993. Uh, St. Norbert has had a varsity hockey program for a total of four years. They started in 89. And in 1993, there was sort of, um, Sandy O was, was uh, present, and so was Elf, and so were many of the people in the audience today that I, that I have fond memories of. And I, th I really think at the time it was ditch hockey or hire somebody and put them in, in charge and see if we can't make this thing a little bit more reputable. And thank goodness uh, for me, uh, that's what we did, is, is we went down that path and hired a full-time hockey coach and put the baseball, unfortunately for baseball, put the baseball job as a part-time guy, just flipped them. There wasn't really any new positions created. But at that time on our campus, President Mannion was in charge and uh, he was changing the footprint of this place. Like this place is a beautiful place and it really started under the direction of Tom Mannion. It started with Mr. Compsey and Dr. Rankin and Coach Van, and those were, those were really, for me, those are the key people when I arrived on campus, and they continue to be key people in my life, uh, as not only have they affected the footprint of what we see every day, and our current administrators have done unbelievable things to build and grow from there, um, but clearly, um, uh, that started in that area. When I came on board, I really had a three to five year plan. That's where I thought a three to five year plan. And uh, Julie alluded to this, this is 20 years later, so you don't really see that one coming. It's, it's uh, um, uh, married 22 years next month. Um, 
And I'll, I'll give you uh, married folks some advice and people that are married longer than us, you already know this, but this is the way it works. So if you wanna be married for a long time, you just you gotta set the ground rules. So like in our world, I make all the big decisions and then my wife makes all the small decisions. And then she tells me which ones are big and which ones are small. <laughs> And as a married couple, I'm telling you, you absolutely never, you never go wrong. <laughs> Year one at St. Norbert, uh, again, we were living in Stevens Point at the time, and um, I was driving back and forth an hour and 45 minutes each way. Lots of time to think about different things. Um, Father Gary Meehan uh, opened his arms and opened his doors, and I actually lived at uh, Old St. Joe's at the Priory. They opened a room for me at the Priory. So I lived with the Padres there and kind of really got immersed in what is St. Norbert, and that probably really helped to set me off on the right path uh, when I came over here. Um, interestingly enough, when I, when I moved out, it was about Christmas time, I went to an apartment, and uh, as I was moving out, there was a young Padre moving in by the name of Father James Bereniak. And so I'm moving out, Reniac's moving in, you know, and him and I are like scotch and water. No, we like scotch and water. We weren't <laughs> like scotch and water. So it's probably a very good thing that uh, he and I were not in the Priory at the same time because this place may never have been the same. Um, you know, there's a number of people in my life that I've learned important lessons from and uh, things that stick to me. My dad, as an example, my dad is uh, 83 years old now, uh, worked his entire life, you know, I dropped out of school in ninth grade because he you know, worked on the family farm, but he's a, one of these guys that can do anything. Like he can fix anything, he can come in here, even the electronical stuff, your car breaks down, he fixes it on the side of the road. And one of the things that always stuck to me is he always would reach out and help people. So if he saw a stranded vehicle on the side of the road, we stopped every time. And I still today, when I see cars on the side of the road, I think about that and I go, if we can help this person, why wouldn't we give service back to these people? Now, it's a little different today with the technology and cell phones and everybody seems to have you know, a, a way to help themselves a little bit more and it's different with children in the car and all the rest, but I still always remember the message from my dad, you always extend a hand and try to help. Um, Mr. Compsey said something to me in my interview process and I actually heard Ed Lamb repeat it here yesterday and he's exactly right. Whatever you're doing, wherever you're at, it's all about the people. It's all about the people that you're around. It's the people that you work for, the people that you work with. It's truly uh, all about the people, and that's what this place to me um, means very, very much. Um, another good friend of mine in town came to town the same time as I did, 1993 area, Red Batty, who's the equipment guy for the Green Bay Packers, and his mother had a really good saying, and I've sort of adopted it as my own, and that is that, that, that God gives you two hands, one to take care of your family, and one, to extend and help others. And I just think about the Norbertine principles of self-emptying service and uh, that sticks to me. The other thing that Red says all the time is we're the lucky ones because we are in a position to help other people. And that is so true. We, all of us here today, are the lucky ones because we have the opportunity to make a difference in other people's lives. Uh, so again, important lessons that I've sort of learned along the way. Coach Van Alstine was the first person in my life to continuously talk about the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And even growing up Catholic, and you know, we weren't practicing uh, like we do now, um, but Coach Van really, uh, every, you know, just anything that happened, that's the Holy Spirit at work. And it really has stuck with me. And I think that's part of my message today is how the Holy Spirit works. And hopefully, again, as we connect the dots later, that, that makes sense. Uh, Coach Van is also, <clears throat> because I was thinking of who's the most spiritual man I know when my son was born, and it's Coach Van Alstine, and he is, uh, we named him, or we asked him if he would be Joseph's godfather, and he accepted, so he's also the godfather to uh, my, my only son. Uh, and, and Father James, I, I touched on a little bit, you know, we have a, just a really good relationship, and within our uh, program, he is the one guy that consistently comes to us and, hey, how can I help you, what can I do for you? He's in the locker room uh, um, talking to guys, he's dealing with all the issues within our students' lives. He obviously has had such a personal impact on uh, all the people at Old St. Joe's for all these years, and now he's the prior, uh, headed up the other way. I just think within our own small cycle, the, my first two captains, a young man by the name of Silverio Myro and another young man named Corey Boris. Well, both of those two graduated from here, married girls from St. Norbert, Father Jim's been involved in their lives, so not only has he baptized my, both of my children, but he's also uh, been involved in the baptisms of their children. Uh, Heidi and Syl have three boys, Silverio, Antonio, and Roberto. Uh, they named me godfather for Roberto, which I gotta tell you is just a, an incredible experience, uh, very flattering. Uh, Corey and Stacy have twin boys, Austin and Caden, and they're 
oldest girl is, is uh, Grace, and they asked me to be godfather for Grace. And then the young man that just left our program last year and became the head coach at, at Marion University, AJ Aiken and his wife Rachel, they've been here for nine years. Ian and Eliza, and they just had a new little baby last spring, Hattie, Hattie Isabel, and they asked me to God, be a godfather for uh, Hattie. And I can't tell you again just how, how that makes me feel when I went through what I was looking uh, to talk about um, when we were looking for godparents for Joseph. So uh, fast forward a little bit here. Matthew Kelly, is, uh, some would call him a scholar, some would just call him a motivational speaker on Catholicism, written multiple books. Um, Rediscovering Catholicism is a big one. It's on my wife's bedside. Seven Pillars of the Catholic Church. One of the things I really like that he talks about is becoming the very best version of yourself. And we talk about that. Some of my guys are in the back of the room. We talk about that in the locker room. We say reinvent yourself daily when it comes to your spiritual life, when it comes to your academic life, when it comes to your social life, when anything, any facet of your life that you're not comfortable, you can reinvent yourself daily and become somebody else. And again, in the words of, of Matthew Kelly, that's becoming the very best version of self. And I think that's something that, you know, all of us can, uh, here's a side story, I have lots of side stories. So I'm flying back from, from somewhere recruiting, and it's late, it's like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock on a Sunday night, my wife leaves her car for me at the airport so that I've got a car and they don't have to come and try to find me. So I jump in her car and she always listens to Relevant Radio. So Relevant Radio's on, I get on the highway, I'm shooting up, uh, shooting up the highway and uh, there's this speaker and he's an Australian guy and he's got this really strong accent and this, but he's just passionate about what he's talking about. And I'm wound up, by the time I get home, I burst through the door, Barb's standing in the kitchen, I've been gone for a week, and she's like, hey, what's going on? Give me a piece of paper, give me a pen, I'm writing, scribbling notes to myself so I don't forget what I heard from this guy. And Barb's listening and I'm tr describing what the guy sounds like. She's like, well, was it Matthew Kelly? And I said, well, I, I don't know. She slides, pulls the drawer open, takes a CD, throws it across. That's the CD I gave you two and a half years ago, Matthew <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> So sometimes we're a little further behind the curve than we necessarily um, should be. A couple of other things that I, that I really like about Matthew Kelly is, is he really focuses back on the nuclear family. And he spends a lot of time talking about families today and how important it is to pray together, how important it is to have meal time together, how important it is to create a culture of family. Uh, and that's an important piece in our lives, how important it is for service to others. Again, self-emptying service, a Norbertine principle, just all things that, that click and they make a lot of sense in my life. Um, young Joseph came to uh, live with us in 2000, let me back up just for one second. Uh, two other pieces on Matthew Kelly. <clears throat> we all know the statistical analysis right now in divorce rate, it's one in two, right? One in two. Think about this. One and two, does it really have to be that way? Like, do we have to be one and two? Or is that just where we've sort of trended for whatever reason? Because all the people I know, all the families that I hang out with, they're not one and two. They're not. As a matter of fact, families that go to church together are one in 2,000. That's a little different statistical than one and two, when it's one in 2,000. And uh, I think like in my own family, we were, uh, I, mom and dad were divorced when I was 13, which was probably a tough time when you're 13 and mom and dad get a divorce. But of the five siblings, of the five of us, we have 110 plus years of marriage at Barb and I at 22 are on the low side. So really, I think it just depends on the, the, circles, that you, uh, the circles that you run in, the people that you associate. It's like my guy sitting in the back row right now. I would say to you, where do you think it's more likely you're gonna find a spiritual connection with a person? Is it Baba Louie's at 2 a.m.? Or is it Old St. Joe's Church at 4 p.m. on Sunday? Where, where, where are you gonna find your spiritual connection, right? So again, talk about um, becoming the best version of yourself. Uh, redefine that uh, for yourself. Life's sort of flying by at SNC. Uh, it's a very smooth ride for a very long time. It's kind of like, um, you know, you're at an airplane at 37,000 feet and there's no bumps in the road. We just, we had nothing, I mean, the, the, the regular stuff that most families have, but there's been real no hiccups for us for a very long stretch of time. and. Um, 2006, our son Joseph is born, uh, and he's in attendance up here tonight. Uh, and just, you know, people talk to you about the birth of your son or birth of a child. Y you can talk all you want until you're there. It's unbelievable. Y you have to experience it firsthand to understand what people are saying. And uh, Joseph uh, clearly um, 
just, a, just an amazing person for us and, and the wow factor. Uh, Joseph will turn seven next week, uh, as a matter of fact, on Tuesday, and he has just been a complete blessing from God, and we know that. We absolutely know that Joseph has been a complete blessing from God to us, um, and we, didn't, we never knew kids were this much fun. I mean, honestly, if I'd have known kids were this much fun, we'd have started earlier. Uh, probably been like Ed Lamb and had a whole hockey line by now. <laughs> Joseph enjoys uh, playing the piano, had his second recital last uh, Sunday. He got long skinny fingers like his dad, so he's got, and he's got the musical talents of his mother. Uh, Joseph enjoys hockey, soccer, and unfortunately for his mother, at six, he also has a motorcycle. So we'll, uh, that was an oops on my behalf when I forgot to mention it, but just brought it home. That was one of those deals. I think it was because I was afraid of the answer, so I just did it. It's one of those, pay the consequence. Barb uh, stayed home with Joseph in his first year and, um, well, is staying home now still. Uh, but Barb uh, taught Joseph sign language, which was a cool thing for me to see. She taught him sign from the time he was never, right, all the way up. So that he could tell if he, if he wanted milk, he would tell you. If he wanted juice, he would tell you. If he wanted water, even though he had no speech, we could really, and by the time he started talking, this was an amazing thing for me to see. By the start, he started talking, he had, like he had sentences. It wasn't words because he was already putting sentences together through American Sign Language. So, you know, um, it was interesting just to see. A uh, couple years uh, after Joseph was born, the 2008 uh, St. Norbert hockey team uh, wins the national championship, first national championship in school history uh, for any team sport. And I mean, the highs are the highs. This is sort of the pinnacle from the athletic standpoint. Joseph's two years old, Barb's pregnant, we're about to have our second child. The highs are the highs, and there's just, there's lots going on at this time. Uh, my mom was sick, uh, eventually died in 2010. Um, our daughter was born on June the 3rd with um, multiple complications that we did not see nor have any inkling were coming our direction. Uh, Faith has trisomy 21, which is more commonly Down syndrome to most of us, um, which is in and of itself is, is not an issue. The issue was the respiratory and the breathing. And so this is a close-up picture of Faith in the NICU uh, at St. V. She was born at St. Mary's. And again, had we had any inkling that something was going, we'd have just gone to, you know, to St. V's to begin with because we know the NICU is there. So Barb didn't even get to see her. They kind of whisked her off. And then immediately the doctor pulled me aside and said, you know, we are seeing some signs here, soft signs, kind of like we think this might be trisomy 21 as well. So I'm sitting on the bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm trying to explain to Barb. She's just gone through this birthing process. And she's like, what? Because Barb, don't forget, is a school psychologist. She does IEPs, individual education plans for kids with disabilities. She is in the school system for 16 years. She knows all about speech all about occupational therapy, all about all, all the things that come, audio, everything. And so she's listening to this dialogue and she, I mean, it, it's a lot to take on at one time. Uh, the day after Faith was born, Barb's mom was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer deep in the center, it's inoperable. The day after Faith was born. Ultimately, by the time um, Faith reaches age of three, uh, Barb's mom actually died on Faith's birthday. So we go from this sort of really smooth ride with no bumps in the air, to having just a lot more going on all at one time. So this image is kind of a close-up of when Faith was born. This is the image of reality for us at that time. This is what kept Faith alive. They completely shut her body down. Um, you know, we were searching for answers. We actually spent that entire month of June driving from the NICU here over to uh, the Marshfield Clinic where Barb's mom was in the hospital back to our house in Waiwig at the time. And we did that every day for the entire month. We were just driving, driving, driving. Joseph, at two years old finally, was screaming in the back of the car one time. And I was like, Joseph, what do you want? And he's just, I want down. That's all he wanted, down. Because he's in his car seat and he's buckled in, and then you're in the hospital and you're buckled in, and then you're in the car seat and it just, he's two. All he wanted was down. So you certainly understand that. But uh, this is an image again of uh, uh, Faith's uh, first 30 days of her life. On a scale of one to 10, we found this out afterwards, on a scale of one to 10, one being, yes, she's got some complications, but she goes home and, and down center, she goes home on a normal scale with the parents, and 10 being she never leaves the hospital, ever. She was a nine for the first 10 days, and this is what it looked like. Uh, first time she was able to pop out, and you actually got to uh, glom onto her a little bit. This is just probably one day in the afternoon where uh, we, had, we had come from the other hospital and ended up here. and. Um, Faith is obviously making progress at, at this point in time. This is an image of her as things continue. She's two years old here. 
And uh, two days after this picture was taken, she came walking down the hallway to our bedroom and she just looked like a dish rag. She was just like white as a ghost. Well, we run into the emergency room. She's full-time diabetic. So she's got some autoimmune things going on too. Uh, so she ends up being a type one diabetic, which now we handle with you know, injections every day. It's f five, roughly six needles a day, plus 10 or 12 pokes just to keep track of her blood sugar. Um, all things that type one diabetics do. And then she's also, another little autoimmune piece was the Graves disease, which is a thyroid condition, and it just screws their blood sugar. So honestly, like, you know, the work that my wife does um, every day with Faith is, we're so thankful that she's at home. Uh, there's a good shot of Joseph and Faith uh, after Faith had been released from the hospital and in that first year. And probably a little better image there of what they look like today and, uh, and how well they're doing today. So um, that's, that's kind of uh, the Faith story. So, you know, again, today the kids are great. Um, Faith has no speech no verbal speech, but her signs are through the roof. Uh, you know, again, uh, she's probably got, I don't know, I'd say 300 signs, but, but you can't differentiate them all because she's a little quick on it and, you know, but you know who can? Joseph, because he knows American Sign Language and he's all over it and he is absolutely her best advocate. Um, Barb is uh, uh, an amazing mother, an amazing teacher. Uh, both kids are at home and, and doing very, very well. And so we've sort of, you know, we look back at a lot of things in our lives and we say, I didn't know it then, but I do now. I don't know why we did it then, but it makes sense now. And I think that's just kind of the, the nature of the beast as you get a little older and a little more reflective and you look back. Um, same as Barb's background, I talked about that as being a, a psychologist. Um, you know, are we 100% sure the Holy Spirit was at work preparing us to uh, be Joseph and Faith's parents? Yeah, we are. There's, there's just no doubt in our minds. I mean, there's no doubt that Barb went through the training she went through. There's no doubt that we were at the spot where we are. There's just, there's just no doubt that uh, the Holy Spirit was training us and that we are the most capable parents to be able to help both Joseph and Faith. And uh, Faith is ours because, you know, we're her best shot. And Joseph is ours because he's a rock star brother and he's just a really good kid and it's amazing to watch him. As a matter of fact, he defends his sister when I'm scolding his sister, which we gotta talk about that sometime because <laughs> just, this, uh, just this winter, Joseph taught Faith how to skate on the pond. A couple of people in the room have seen the video and it's, it's amazing to see the video. Uh, put your arms out and he gets her going and she's just kind of walking around. But you know, for, again, for a young lady in her circumstances, uh, it, it is amazing uh, to see. So th that's what our family sort of looks like today. I know Barb and the kids are here and they'll be around a little bit later. Uh, so do I believe that things happen for a reason? You bet. Do I believe that we are guided by the Holy Spirit in all facets of life? You bet. Do I look back at lots of things in my life and say, I didn't know it then, but I do now? You bet. Make the best informed decision you can with the information you have. You bet. We don't have the answers. Um, I'm going to get back to the first slide, which was, I am a hockey coach. And I'm going to answer it by saying this. In reality, I coach 26 men, young men, that are on our campus in academics, in their social life, in their relationships, in their personal values, in death in the family, in everything that comes to be with being a young man on campus. And help them, I advise them to make the best decisions they can with the information they have. And I also coach hockey. But in reality, I coach 26 young men in a lot of other areas. And I know that in my life, um, Life is a journey and it's not a script. I know there's no A to B, and I know that the Holy Spirit is at work, and I know that the Holy Spirit is at work in their lives as well. So uh, I certainly uh, thank all of you for being here today. That's a little bit of our journey, and hopefully we've gone back and connected some dots and uh, made sense for s some of you in here. Uh, so I thank you. Uh, I hope God blesses all of your families as he has ours, and I appreciate uh, everybody coming out this morning. And uh, to our students, best of luck uh, down the stretch here with finals. Uh, to everybody involved. So thank you very much.